Today's youth need teachers, volunteers, and most of all, well, they need you. I'm Doug Edwards, and I'm going to be talking with real youth mentors and students to give you the knowledge you need to be the best youth worker possible. This is Youth Worker on Fire. Hey everybody, it's Doug Edwards. Here we are on another episode, and I have a very special friend that uh, known for quite a while. When we met each other, uh, we were at the same church. I was a youth worker there. We actually, she and her husband Eric and my wife Colleen went through marriage class together. Mm-hmm. We did all kinds of stuff. We're going to give you a little bit of background on her and that. Her dad was from Cuba. Her mom was from Puerto Rico. That means they eat great food. (laughs) And uh, also, that's right. And though she lived in the Florida Keys for a long, long time. And so 90 degrees feels like it's just right. So if you don't like 90 degree weather, then uh, if you do, then you understand Carrie and where she's coming from. But Carrie, just to give people a feel for your real life growing up, Here's what I want you to tell us about, because very few people have probably heard these stories. Talk about growing up with your dad and swimming in the Florida Keys, and you know what <laughs> story I'll end up asking about, but so that people kind of understand what your life was like growing up. Yeah. Food and uh, food in the ocean were, were two big things when I was growing up, that's for sure. Um, well, my dad was a fisherman, and we lived in the Keys for a long time. Um, and I would go out on the boats with him. We would go snorkeling sometimes. Uh, we'd go lobster fishing. We'd go crab fishing. We'd go just fishing. We would snorkel a lot. We'd be in the water together. And a couple of times um, while we were in the water, there were bigger fish in the water than we were. <laughs> <laughs> we were in um, about an 18-foot aqua sport, which is just a good-sized boat, and it had a center console, and we were out in the water. Uh, Dad and I had anchored, and we were looking around, and um, I felt him tapping me on the shoulder, and I look back, and we're underwater, so of course he can't talk. So he looks at me, and he puts his finger over his his mouth, which means don't say anything, be quiet, you know, stay still. And then he told me to look over to the side, and when I looked over at the side, there was this huge shadow, and it was moving. And it was moving past our boat and it turned out to be like a tiger shark, which I started to go, (gasps) and he grabbed my shoulder and he called me down. He said, stay, stay. So I just kind of stayed still and watched this huge thing swim by our boat. And it was bigger than our boat by quite a bit. (laughs) So it was kind of scary. But once it got past... And he thought it was far enough away. He he gave me a nod, and he made a sign to go to the boat, and we went back to that boat and went home. <laughs> <laughs> and that was enough. <laughs> that was day over, fishy yes. day over. <laughs> yes, we were done. <laughs> and so you never went to the ocean again, and you moved farther north. And no, no, I mean, absolutely of not. not. <laughs> we were in the ocean the next day. My dad was pretty much fearless. And when I was with him, I felt safe because I knew that there was nothing that was going to hurt me as long as I was with him. So wow. I'd go back into the water as many times as he wanted me to. Some of those fish did you take home? Did you take to the restaurant and things like that? Yeah. Well, the restaurant, we were in the Keys. The restaurant was actually um, on South Beach. My dad and my uncle came from Cuba um, and my dad started a carpet company. And then when he brought my grandfather and my grandmother, um, they kind of turned it into a tourist shop and um, ended up opening the restaurant on the other corner. Um, so it was like a whole family thing. It was a family business. Wow. Um, and yeah, dad would bring some of the, the stuff that we would catch and that he would catch with his team uh, to the restaurant. And that would be the seafood. It would be fresh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be really fresh. Yeah, it was good. Here you are now. You're up in Central Florida. Mm-hmm. You and I work together. You're a pharmacist now. You and Eric both, very tenacious people, very uh, strong people. 
you all have this fire inside you that yeah. makes you both high achievers. So at age 30, you decided to become a pharmacist. You had had a lot of other things. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, I, I went back to school at um, 27, and I went back. I started pharmacy school at 30. I mean, that's that's a tenacious spirit. That's tough. You could have said, you know, no way. That's too hard. I always call her Dr. Carey. Yes, you uh, do. Dr. Free, because <laughs> now pharmacists over the last, I don't know how many years now, but you have to be a doctor now. You have to yeah. finish that doctor's degree to be a pharmacist. So you're Dr. Carey Free. <laughs> and so we, we do that. And she's in, ter- in charge of the long-term care. Yeah. She's the pharmacist for long-term care at a place called Bay Lake Pharmacy. Mm-hmm. We're hidden up upstairs. And uh, I tell people we're, we're, we're the upstairs people now. and the and then later when we go into the new building, we'll be the downstairs people. Yes, we will. <laughs> so, <laughs> nothing in between. We don't get to see, you know, the, the world like everybody else. It's up or down. So yeah. we're, we're going to be downstairs. After I stopped student ministry, I was looking for a job a few years later. And Carrie was there and things worked out. So I get to work with her at least five days a week. Yeah. Here we are, though. A pharmacist is, or any kind of medical personnel like that is like worth a million. So catch us up to date, though. And where life has led you to? A lot's going on. It's a busy time. Um, I do have two daughters. They are now 18. They graduated high school. They're getting ready to go off to college in about three weeks. (laughs) We're going to be dropping them off. Um, They are going to two different colleges, um, which is good and bad, I guess. Um, They're both staying in Florida, which is a good thing for us. Um, So uh, they're excited. We're, We're... finishing stuff up, getting stuff ready for them, as well as working. They're both working. Um, Eric is working. <laughs> we're all, <laughs> you know, we're all busy. Um, but uh, life is good. God is, God is good. He has been good to us. Um, he's helped us all through some good times and through some bad times and uh, brought us out the other side. And we're just, we're just very thankful and grateful that we have him and that we know him and that he is our rock. Carrie was a volunteer with me for college mm-hmm. and career students. Yep. Uh, we used to go to a place, especially for called the, I forgot the name of the place. What was the name of that restaurant? One Flight Up. In One Mount Flight Dora. Up. There yep. you go. That was it. <laughs> That's it. Don't even remember what I used to do. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we used to work with college students, and that was one of the meeting places that we'd meet at. Eric, his her husband, Eric, did middle school work with me. He is a mechanical engineer. But he was absolutely fabulous with uh, middle school students. And for those of you who work with middle school students and you love them, you know that once you volunteer with middle school students and that's your love, you don't really want to go anywhere else. And so here Carrie is full circle again. I've been gone for almost nine years from there. Now their new youth pastor, Zane Balmer, and his wife, Mackenzie, are doing things. And so they said, Carrie, you know, the girls have graduated this year. Why don't you go on a student missions trip with us? And where did they decide they were going to go? Uh, Miami. Which uh, we call a foreign country. Pretty much. So uh, <laughs> for, for, for those of you who live in Miami, you're going, yep, that's right. And for those of you who have visited uh, outside of Miami, you go there and you go, oh, this is a, a foreign country. This is, there are more people that speak other languages other than English here. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how they asked you and how you ended up going. And just tell us a little bit about how that whole scenario, you know, ended up for you. Why, why you? Well, um, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, they never really asked me. Um, oh. They actually presented to the congregation that they were going to do this mission trip to Miami. Um, and they were just talking about, you know, what it was going to be like, what it entailed, what their plan was. And I just felt God telling me that I needed to go and be on that trip. Um, so when they finished, when the service was over and I saw them, I walked right up to them and I said, okay, I need to go on that trip. And they looked at me and they said, really? And I said, yep. Um, is it all right if I go? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> of course I walked up and I said, I need to go. And then I said, oh, maybe I should ask. Is it, <laughs> is it okay if I go? <laughs> um, and they were, they were positive about it and they wanted me to go. So it worked out well. Yeah. I just, I just felt like I needed to be there. 
and God led me there. Yeah, and and here's the thing about all of that. I don't know, you know, which youth workers or volunteers or parents are even listening or whatever doing this thing right now, but but I do know that there are people that involved with students uh, that that are listening to this. A medical personnel's worth their weight in gold to me <laughs> when I would do a student ministry trip. If you had medical background, if you had any kind of medical in your history to where you've dealt with people on a medical level, or if you're a doctor, a pharmacist who is a doctor, or you are a medic, we actually had a medic that went with us on a couple of trips uh, before who was a, had been a medic for the Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines. Oh, wow. <laughs> All of them. And uh, he went on two different trips. One was a winter retreat and one was a mission trip. So people like you are worth their weight in gold to the security of a trip because you understand things that we don't understand about the human body, about what's happening and all that stuff. Now, what people don't understand, I was going to save this till the end, but let's fuse this in since since I've been fusing things (laughs) already anyway. And that is that Carrie and Eric have been running a Guatemala mission for how many years now? Eric has been president of Mission House probably for about six or seven years. Um, We've been involved since 2009, but he's been president for, yeah, seven or eight maybe actually, Um, because Charlie Stewart, who was in charge um, stateside, brought Eric along um, for about a year and a half before making him, uh, or switching over, giving him the reins and introducing him to everybody. It's been a while now that I think about it. 2009, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's been a couple of years now. Yeah. <laughs> and that mission had been going on for quite a while before that. Yes. Uh, Wes Collins and his wife Nancy had started that mission mm-hmm. through Wycliffe Translators. Yep. And then uh, I did about five years with Charlie and the Fergusons, different people, for people to understand, flying fly to Guatemala City, eight-hour drive out, mm-hmm. and you are in the Mayan nation. Yep. You are with, my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, I remember numbers and people go, are, you're crazy. Those aren't the numbers. But anyway, uh, my understanding was, you, of course, we never saw them except for close to it, maybe market day, and then still not all of them, but about 40,000 in that St. John's District, uh, Comitancio in the mountains and all that. Is that right? Yeah. About 40,000, somewhere like that? Yeah, about 40 to 50, I'd say. And then you'd you'd mainly see the majority of them on market day, even though Mm -hmm. you were in the the city of Comitancio, which was way out, by the way. How many trips do you think that you have taken? I personally have gone, I think, 12 times. Um, and Eric has gone a few more times than that, <laughs> quite a few more. <laughs> and we're going to bounce back now. I want to give them perspective of your experiences, the person that you are. And we're talking volunteer. Number one, volunteers on the average last about a year. You and Eric, with me alone, I think you guys are two or three years. You might have been four, something like that. Then his volunteer, y'all went on and, and did a WANA. The missions project since 2009. You're not an average volunteer. <laughs> you know, neither one of you, way above average. People are going to learn a lot from you and what you're saying here. So let's go back to Miami now. Tell me what it was like looking back. You're two weeks out since you've been right. on the project. It was different. Um, It was a different set of circumstances for me. With the Guatemala trips, I was used to just going and jumping right in, hands-on, being part of the team, working with the kids, going on the house visits, um, just being one of the workers um, and just doing it. And then, you know, Eric would be in charge or um, Buddy and Dolores were in charge one year or... You know, there were different people who were leading the trips. Um, Eric led most of our trips after the first year. Um, And people would say, oh, well, you know, you and Eric lead. And I'm like, no, no, Eric leads. I'm his wife. (laughs) I'm on this this trip just like you are. And if he says we're doing this, that's what we're doing. I don't make the decisions. (laughs) On this trip to Miami, 
um, I was really excited. And I first day I jumped right in, hands on. I was, you know, doing things. And then I was like, wait a minute, you know, Kenzie and, and Zane would have um, say, okay, well, we're meeting for this and we're doing this. And it's like, oh, okay. So I'm not all hands on the whole time. I'm kind of doing this other stuff on the side. Um, and yeah, I guess that's that's what leaders do, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So leaders lead. Yeah, and- yeah. So, you know, as a leader, yeah, I had the freedom to jump in and and do things with the kids um that we were there to minister to and as part of the team. But then I also had other responsibilities and other things that I did, which was kind of cool, you know, and, and I actually enjoyed it. So it was, it was a nice change, but it was, it was a wonderful trip. And going back to Miami after so many years was really impactful as well. Um, cause I grew up in Miami and then in the Keys. Um, and I've moved here, like you said, we're in central Florida. So things are a little different here <laughs> than yeah, they are in bit, Miami. A little bit. Um, going back and being there for a whole week with a team and just seeing people and remembering my childhood and what it was like when I was there and seeing these people that were going through similar things kind of touched me. It was actually kind of cool. It was nice to be able to be there on a different plane to help minister to these people when I understood where they were coming from and who they were. So worst moment, give me your worst moment, best moment. Worst moment. Um, I was, I was in the kindergarten room for part of my time there. Cause I, I just love the little kids. They're so, they're just so real, you know, little kids don't lie. They tell you what it is, just how it is. And, and you can see everything they're feeling. Um, so, one of the days there was a little boy um, and he was very affectionate and he would always ask, do you love me? Do you love me? You know, and, and he obviously needed to feel loved. Um, and there was some issue where there was an issue with him and one of the other boys and they didn't get along. And the teacher um, pulled him aside and said, we're going to have to call your mom if, you know, you, you hit this little boy again. And he threw himself down on the floor and was crying and said, you don't love me. You don't love me. I want to die. Oh, wow. And this is a five-year-old little boy. It's like, how would he even come up with that? Why would, why would those words come out of his mouth? I want to die. I want to die. And my heart just broke right there. And I, I picked him up and I hugged him. And I told him, I love you. I love you. I love you. We don't want you to die. We want you here. God made you. There's only one you. We need you to be here because that's why God put you here. So please don't ever say that. And he said, and he was crying still and said, so do you love me? Do you really love me? I said, yes, of course I love you. And you know what's more important? Jesus loves you. And he said, Jesus loves me? I said, yes, Jesus loves you. Why do you think he put you here? And he just, he just was, you know, weeping and, and slowly calming down. But that just, that just broke my heart. A little five-year-old boy would even think something like that, let alone be screaming it as he's on the floor crying. That's a very moving moment. And those are, those are the places, you, those are the people you don't see unless you're involved in places that are uncomfortable. Yeah. And most of us don't like to be uncomfortable. I don't like to be uncomfortable. But when you go on trips like that, it forces you to be in an uncomfortable state with uncomfortable people who are aching for Christ. And that's where we see the reality of Christ, not when we're in church away from people who desperately need Jesus. Church is places to bring people like that in and their families and show love where they've never felt that kind of unconditional love before. Very difficult place. That's amazing. That's amazing. Tell me your best story now of the Miami trip. Oh, wow. There were a lot of really good moments. <laughs> Basically, just just seeing the students that we took down there, because, um, of course, everybody has their own expectation 
right, before you go on the trip. So just seeing the students on the first day as we got together um, and we're talking about things and every evening we would worship um, and pray and um, just share some time together. Seeing the progression from the first day to the third day to the fifth day, by the third day, those kids, yes, they had seen each other and they knew each other. They were singing their hearts out. They were hugging each other. They were praying together for each other. And they were just laying it all out on the line. And I think that at those times, I just saw the power of God right there. It's like Jesus was so alive and working in those kids' hearts. And in them, we had gone to serve other people. But in those moments, Jesus was working in each of their hearts as well. And I think that's what will stick with me the most from this trip is just seeing them grow in their faith, seeing them go from being very bashful and not wanting and to even talk to anybody. Um, and then on our second day there, we went on a prayer walk on South Beach with signs that said free prayer and walking up to strangers and saying, hey, can we pray for you? So what happened there? Did, did y'all pray for people? Did some people say, most people say yes? Um, well, it was a mixed bag. It was a mixed bag. Um, we broke up into groups and a lot of people would say no thanks and just keep walking. And, you know, ha ha, we prayed for them anyway. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> just, right. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and um, quite a few of the people that said, yeah, sure, you can pray for me. And we'd ask, okay, what can we pray for? They'd say, well... For wealth or, or health. Those are the two most popular. Health and wealth. Pray that I can get enough money. You know, and it's just like that hits you in the face. It's like, okay, that's not normally a thing that we pray for, but yeah, we're here to pray for you. So, you know, and, and through the prayer, you know, we, we would share the gospel. And um, again, some of the kids were very bashful, but across the course of, of the day doing it, they opened up and there were a few of them that were just out there praying their hearts out for people and just walking up to strangers like they'd known them all their lives. Hey there, sir, how can I, you know, it was, it was, it was really cool to watch, watch the kids do that. So let's, let's jump back to Guatemala. And, for, and before we go any farther, if people want to get in touch with you and Eric. There's actually a website. It's Mission Housing Ministries. So it's mhmguatemala.org. M as in Mary, H as in Harry, M as in Mary for Mission House Ministries. So mhmguatemala.org. Um, and um, that has links to all of the different people who are involved, all of the volunteers um, and you can get in touch with Eric, you can get in touch with me, you can get in touch with Leslie, you can get in touch with Ovidio, who's in Guatemala. Lots, lots of people that way, and it shows everything that we do, and it has links to emails and videos and information. Now, worst and best moments in Guatemala? Our very, very first trip to Guatemala, which was a whirlwind. Um, there was a lot going on on our side. My dad was... Um, dying of cancer. Um, and my mom and I had gone to visit him for a few days before our trip. And we were driving back to Florida um, the night before the trip. We were supposed to leave to go to the airport at five in the morning. Um, the person who was supposed to lead the trip was not able to lead the trip because they had had a health issue. So um, Buddy and Dolores came in and Franz Martins came in and took over that trip. We got there. We got on the plane. Our girls were about four years old at the time. And we have twin girls. So, yeah, it was my husband and I and our twin girls and my mom um, went on this trip. First mission trip ever. Uh, and we were going to change the world. And it was wonderful. And we were all excited. And... Um, we went there to serve and to help people, and we met so many wonderful, amazing people. Um, but while we were there, one of the days that we were in the village, uh, 
Dolores McCrory came up to my mom and I and asked us to share our story with the Mayan people with and with the women particularly. And as we did that, these wonderful women who I've never met before and I had never seen before and were in a totally different country started reaching out and weeping with my mom and I and praying for us and hugging us and holding our hands and telling us that they were going to continue to pray for us, that God loved us and that they understood what we were going through because they had gone through similar things, which I think is why Dolores wanted us to tell that story. It was just amazing and totally unexpected um, because we went to go help them. It wasn't supposed to be the other way around. You know, yes, yes, it's like, what, right, you're helping right. me? No, wait, no, that's not, that wasn't the idea. <laughs> We're here to help you. You can't help me. But no, that's exactly what happened is, is, you know, they helped my mom and I work through a whole bunch of our own emotion with what was going on with my dad and, and his illness and everything that led up to it. So, yeah, that was, that would have to be one of, I think, the best. Um, it was. Yeah, we cried and everything, but it was still the best. Well, Guatemala is quite a mission, and we've talked about this, so I'll say this. For those who are youth pastors, my preference always is to go with a student missions group that's designed for students. But if you are secure in what you're doing and how you're handling your people, the Guatemala trip with Carrie and Eric is a beyond amazing trip. It does not have all the safeguards. You would have to talk to them about all the safeguards they have. And because you were still pretty much on your own, even though you're with them. The five times we went were beyond amazing. Uh, They were life-changing for every student that we took. Unless you've been to Central America, unless you've been to the interior of places like that. You know, we go to vacation a lot of these places. We did many missions in the Dominican Republic. Well, and on the last day, they would take us to a resort, and we would have five-star resort and all that the day before we'd fly out to come back home. That never completely happened in Guatemala. You didn't (laughs) quite get the five-star thing coming back or going in. So I'm always impressed with you and Eric and what you do. I'm impressed with you on a daily basis of what you do at Bay Pharmacy. The pressures, guys, you would not believe what... Uh, long-term care, and the rest of the pharmacy deal with, with patients day after day. George Warren and his family. and They're amazing. The, the, the ministry, they've met, they would not call it a ministry. It's one of the, uh, I think, the largest private pharmacy in the state of Florida. It gave me a way to support my family after 35 years of full-time ministry and then um, allowed me to do things like this podcast because we pay our bills. Yeah. And we still get to help so many, many people, which uh, you are key to. And we have some very amazing pharmacists that alongside you that when you have to be out, that they come up and, and help. And and uh, so what an amazing place we work at, right? Absolutely. We got a great family, great family. <laughs> Far- family? Yes. <laughs> family, right. And so, Carrie, anything else you want to tell uh, any of your, anybody this, that will be listening from your family or anything, anything you want to tell youth workers? What's some closing thoughts that you just want to leave with people? I think at the end of the day, it comes down to love. Um, loving others as Christ loves us and sharing that love and speaking the gospel in love. Um, you know, it's it's... It's important to show the love. Like you said, you know, a lot of people just see, oh, well, you know, why does God let this happen? And why does God do this? And, oh, you know, you hear the critics saying, oh, well, the Old Testament and God wasn't all about love. It's like, no, God has always been all about love. Just like a parent is always loving their child, even when they're being tough. It's because they love them that they're being tough. So, you know, if, if you don't know whether or not you want to serve or you don't know what to do with yourself, just open up and, and, 
and love on people. If you love them, the doors will open. Nobody cares how much you know till they know how much you care. You taught me that many years ago. <laughs> yeah, we that, that was taught to me. I taught it to you guys, and y'all teach it to others because it's true. That's the way we feel about people who approach us if they love us. We we pour into them. If when we pour love into other people, they pour back to us. They just want to know: Do you really care? Do you really love? Carrie, I always appreciate you. Thank you so much for taking this time. This is way after hours, which we uh, you've spent many way after hours and early mornings with uh, so many many people on a daily basis. And so, thank you so much. Love to your family, and uh, Eric, tell Eric thanks for loaning you out to allow you to do this podcast for a while. No worries. And I will see you tomorrow and everyone else in youth worker land. uh, We will see y'all in the next episode. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate you. You've been listening to the Youth Worker on Fire podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and tell your friends. Also, leave a comment and tell us what you think. Stay tuned for more informative episodes.